Fu year. And I know that uh, it's so good to have you here in church today celebrating with us the Lord. I, I heard about a fellow early in the new year. He was praying and he said to God, God, so far I haven't lost my temper. So far I haven't been rude to anyone. So far I haven't cut anybody off in traffic. So far I haven't said anything I shouldn't have said. But in a few minutes, I'm going to get out of bed, and I'm going to need a whole lot of help. <laughs> Most of us uh, can do pretty good at the beginning of the year, uh, but, uh, you know, this is a great new day. And I wanted to start the year and, and preaching through the book of Ephesians. So I want to take you, if you want to, go ahead and turn to the book of Ephesians. I want to give you a little background on this book. And so I'm beginning a sermon series starting today. And today I really want to give you an overview, kind of a 30,000 foot view. I'm not going to go into as much detail as I will going forward. But I want to show you some great things from this book of Ephesians. Ephesians uh, is written to the, the church in Ephesus. And it was the capital city of Asia Minor. It was famous for the Temple of Diana. This temple was a fantastic, colossal building that, in fact, Ephesus became the bank of Asia. This is where they deposited all the money of Asia. They had a statue in there. Artemis was the Greek name for this statue. Diana was the Roman name for the statue. And it was a meteorite that had fallen out of the heavens, and they put it in this temple of Diana, believing that it had dropped out of the heavens. And so, really, they worshipped Diana. They deposited all their money in this temple of Diana. This was a rich, rich city. 300,000 population back there. Joanne and I went to visit Ephesus, and it is now a great tourist site with lots of ruins. The only thing left of the temple of Diana, I think, is one pillar. I remember seeing a placard there and this one pillar. We took a picture of it, and, uh, but it, it doesn't look like the temple of Diana back then. Paul visited Ephesus during his second missionary journey and his third missionary journey. He spent two years there during his third missionary journey, about 55 A.D., kind of places where they were. While he was in Ephesus, there were three different forms of opposition that broke out. First of all, when he went into the city, he went as was his habit to go into the synagogue, and there was great hardening of heart. So he left the synagogue because there was so much opposition and he moved to the school of Tyrannus. In fact, uh, again, we were at Ephesus, and there is still the front facade of the school of Tyrannus there. So he went there and spent two years teaching in this school. Another form of opposition broke out because Paul was doing all kinds of miracles in the city of Ephesus. In fact, that's the passage where it says they would take handkerchiefs from his body and spread it around, and people were being healed. Mighty miracles. I don't recommend that you do that today, but... Back then, that was the kind of thing that was happening. And so there were, he was casting out demons as part of that. And so there were magicians in this town. There was a lot of magic practices in the city of Ephesus. And so these seven sons of Sceva, who were magicians, they were trying to duplicate what Paul was doing. And they, they found a demon-possessed man, and they said, uh, they, I adjure you in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demon's response was, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And they jumped on these seven sons, and they cut them. They were bleeding and naked whenever they were finished with them. So this revival broke out when they saw what the power of God compared to the power of Satan was, so much so that they took all their magical books, and they created a big bonfire and burned all their magical books, and they said the books were worth 50000 drachmas, 50,000 pieces of silver, the equivalent of $2 million today, because there was such a huge outpouring of the Spirit of God, and they saw this contrast between what they were worshiping and what Paul was preaching. And the third form of opposition was this group of silversmiths who were making little statues, silver statues of Artemis, the, the Diana in the Roman god, and they uh, selling these. Basically, people would come from all over Asia, and just like we do when we go into a town, they would buy these like souvenirs, except they were worshiping them. And when Paul began to preach against these gods that were man-made gods, 
people stopped buying these silver Artemis statues. And so the silversmiths started losing money, and they created this huge uproar. In fact, they brought all of those who were followers of Jesus into the square, and they shouted, great is Artemis of Ephesus, great is Artemis of Ephesus for two hours. And the controversy was so great that Paul actually left the city at that point. And so this is the letter that was written to that city, those people. It was a great, grand city. When Paul wrote the letter, he wrote the letter along with Colossians and Philemon, and he sent the letter by way of Tychicus, was a, a faithful person that he could send to that city, actually from Ephesus, so he could, he could uh, communicate with those folks. And along with Philemon, uh, I'm sorry, along with Onesimus, who was the slave of Philemon, and you know the letter to Philemon is about uh, sending to Philemon, tell him to release Onesimus. So this was the time period that Paul wrote this. So that's kind of an introduction of the book. But let me, let me share with you what, what the theme of Ephesians is. The theme is God's master plan for the ages. And throughout the book, you're going to see how God unfolds the plan of God that he has not just for the ages, but for your life. God has a plan for the ages. Would you say that with me? God has a plan for the ages. So God has been planning. on. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's been planning from before the beginning. God has been planning a plan. And, and God has a plan for the ages. God also has a plan for your life and my life. Can you say God has a plan for my life? God has a, and listen, if God made the plan, it's got to be a good plan. Amen? Amen? So can you say God's plan is a good plan? God's plan is a good plan. So God is, has a plan. He has a master plan for the ages. God has a plan for my life. And God's plan is a good plan. And if God has a good plan for my life, here's, here's the declaration that I want you to give. I want to follow God's plan. Can you say that? I want to follow God's plan. You, you see what I'm saying? God has a master plan for the ages. God has a plan for my life. God's plan is a good plan. And I want to follow God's plan. You're going to hear that again a few more times. Kind of like going to the land of more than enough. I want to, I want to get it drilled down into your head that God's plan is a good plan. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Now let's read verses 1 through 14. One of the interesting things about this first chapter here is verses 3 through 14, which we'll read in Greek, is one long sentence. It's 220 Greek words, all without a period. Now, I won't, you won't see that in the text that we're going to read, but that's the way it is in the original. So let's begin with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him also... You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession 
to the praise of his glory. I mean, this is a, a sweeping, sweeping statement of blessing to God because of his master plan that he's worked out. So let me show you today, I just want to point out three major elements from God's master plan. And then I'll dig down, I'll drill down a little bit more next week, and then we'll work our way through the book of Ephesians. And I think you'll see God's plan began to unfold. So three different words. The first is blessing, the second is belonging, and the third is believing. So let's walk through those. First of all, God's master plan for blessings. Every, every single part of God's master plan includes blessings. Verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. God is the source of of all these blessings. God has blessed us. And, and listen, he did this plan, he had this plan, not just uh, at some early point in history, but he had this plan before the beginning. If you notice what he says in verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He started this master plan way back in the annals of time, way before. This is not some last-minute plan. God was planning to bless us from before the beginning. And then think about some of these blessings. It's, he's, he blessed us with the riches of His grace, the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, the riches of His mercy. He blessed us with all these, all these blessings. And believe me, God is rich. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. You know, we sometimes think about the blessings of God and maybe we ask God to fill our needs. Philippians 4.19 says that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And most of us think about those things in terms of physical needs. The things like food and shelter and clothing. But the blessings that are truly special, the, the blessings that are really miraculous and wonderful that God provides are things that money cannot buy. Money cannot buy happiness. Money cannot buy joy. Money cannot buy peace. Money cannot buy fulfillment. Money cannot buy forgiveness. Money can't buy fulfillment. Money can't buy joy. I mean, these are things that are, are priceless. They're, they're, they're things that... Uh, that when you think about what happens whenever a new baby is coming. Now, let, let me just ask you a question. Were you a planned baby or were you an accident? Were, 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 you, were you an oops baby? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, me, I believe I was planned. My sister was the first one to come along. I think she was an accident, but she was loved don't get me wrong whether you were an accident or planned you were loved I mean, if you're here today you were loved somebody had to love God loved you but somebody loved you maybe you know people that that were accidents sometimes they were loved and sometimes they started out as an accident but then the family immediately once they saw mama start the show they said we got to make some plans right but when you plan for a new baby you know you you plan wh wh what are we gonna do for clothing what are we going to do for, we need a crib, we need a bassinet, we need a, a, a car seat, we need all these things, we've got to have clothes, we've got to make sure we're going to have formula, all these things. And, and some families, they'll say, well, you know, we need to start putting away money for the college, right? That's really long-range planning. Why do families do this kind of thing when a baby's coming into the world? Because they want this child to have the very best of everything. They want to make, in fact, some families will, will, give up their sports car and buy a minivan because they love their kids. And then we got to cart these kids around. Uh, nowadays, they don't get minivans. They get an SUV, but it's still a minivan that just looks nicer, right? But, but we plan to bless our children. And I, 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 you, you have to understand that before the beginning of time, God had a master plan to bless us. See, when, when, when we sometimes think about this, it's almost like we look Strictly in time, we don't think about what God was doing back before the beginning of time. Before he made anything, he planned to bless us. He planned to bless us with all these things. Now, now Paul lays out some of these things. He says these are every spiritual blessing, every blessing that is possible in the spiritual realm. I remember uh, hearing about a, a pastor's wife 
telling me about her daughter. They had just moved to a new community, and her daughter went to school. She came home from school, and she said, Mom, are we poor? And her mother said, No, honey, we're rich. And so she went to school the next day, and she said, All the little girls looked at my clothes, and they looked at my shoe, and they said, You're poor. And she said, Are we really rich? And she said, Yes, honey, we're rich in God. Now, I know most of us, we'd rather be rich in, in, uh, in money and not just rich in God. But the richness in God is the, are all these spiritual blessings. And Paul lays out some of them. He names some of them. He says, he chose us. He adopted us. He redeemed us. He forgave us. He lavished grace on us. He granted us an inheritance. He sealed us. And he saved us personally. See, these are, these are basically a foretaste of every blessing. Now, we sometimes don't think about those things. Salvation doesn't seem like that much of a blessing because we don't experience the full breadth of it. We're getting a foretaste. Do you know what a foretaste is? You ever make a pot of chili and you take the spoon in there and, and you sip the chili and you get that foretaste and, man, this is going to be good whenever that chili finishes simmering. You know what I'm saying? What we're experiencing in the here and now is an already, but there is a not yet part to what we're experiencing we're getting right now just a foretaste of what God is ultimately going to do when he fully gets us all the way to glory and all the way to the new heaven and the new earth. But it was all part of God's plan that we should be blessed. And you notice that his blessing is in the heavenly places, he says. See, Peter goes on to describe exactly what Paul is saying here in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. See, the blessings that we have Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. Our blessings are protected by God. Now, now I know that what you want to experience are the blessings down here. And what I'm saying to you is if you ever stop and think about what you have in terms of forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, I mean, think about how many times you have been in a situation where you just wish when you ask someone if they will forgive you for some way that you've harmed them, that you would just love for them to say, I forgive you. I mean, think of the times whenever you've hurt someone's feelings and you say, wouldn't it be great if I could restore that relationship with that person? Wouldn't it be great if you could, in the midst of a really trying and difficult time, feel the assurance of the presence of God with you and find peace in the middle of a storm. You know, sometimes you meet people that are extremely wealthy in this world. They have all, all the money that they could buy, but they're always striving for that next prize, that next amount of money, that next treasure. I, I think sometimes you see the lifestyles of the rich and famous, and sometimes they're talking about they've got a $12 million house over here, and they've got a $30 million house over here, so many houses that, you know, and then they have 30 bedrooms in one and 32 bathrooms in another, and you think to yourself, and there's two people that live there. They have all of this wealth, but they keep on striving. They keep, I've got to get that next thing, the next piece. Wouldn't it be great if you could experience the blessings of God so that all of a sudden you discover, when I have my relationship with God, I have all that I need and all that I want. See, God wants us to experience those blessings now, but also understand that those blessings are long-term blessings that will last for an eternity. Whatever you have in this life, it's ultimately going to burn up. And we see it. We see things deteriorate. We, think, we see things that fall apart. We see things we continually have to repair, but we don't have to do that with the blessings of God. Now, every blessing that we receive comes through belonging. Look at this next point, God's master plan for belonging. Every part of God's master plan is based on being in Christ. Look at that verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. New things have come. This, this in Christ, these blessings that come in Christ, this, this means belonging, that we've, we've come to belong in the family of God. Every single one of those blessings that we're talking about, they don't come to everybody. They come to those who belong to Jesus. Amen. Everyone who is in Christ, he talks about it again and again. Look at, look at these verses, these in Christ verses. Verse 1, the saints at Ephesus who are faithful in Christ. Every blessing in Christ, verse 3. Verse 4, he chose us in him, verse 7. In him we have redemption. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed or planned in him. The summing up of all things in Christ. In him we have obtained an inheritance. In him, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him. 23 times in the book of Ephesians, Paul uses this expression, in Christ, in him, in the beloved. In fact, Paul uses this phrase, in him, over 200 times in his letters. In every single one of his books except the book of Titus. This expression is critical to understanding. You see, when, when we come in Christ, when we belong to the family of God, something different has happened to us. We're not just, you know, the average run-of-the-mill person. Notice that we were born in Adam. We were born, in other words, we were born in the family of Adam. All of us fall under the family headship of Adam when we're born. And when you're born in Adam, you're born with a defect. You have defective DNA. Some of y'all have defective DNA that came from your parents, right? Some of y'all have genetic disorders. Some people get cancer that other people won't. The first thing they ask you whenever you go for cancer screening, they say, did anybody in your family ever have cancer, right? You know, whenever they, they look at a funny spot on my arm, you know, for see if I've got some skin cancer, they see a funny looking mole, they ask me, did anybody in your family ever have skin cancer? I say, no. They go, oh, I'm not worried about that. I'm like, that's the extent of your test, you know, just whether it's in the family or not. There's a lot of genetic disorders, but the biggest genetic disorder that we all have is we all have this fallen nature in Adam. We all have a tendency to push against the rules and regulations. See, God made us with this moral nature. There's something built inside us from the very beginning, and it's this division between right and wrong. And you you notice it very early on. Even, as I said before, you can see the fall in little kids because you don't have to teach them to bad, be bad. They're bad naturally. you got to teach them to be good. But from the very beginning of our life, we have going on in us this, this striving of good versus evil. And when we do good, we feel good about ourselves. When we do evil, we feel guilty. We feel convicted. Something's going wrong. And sometimes when we do something that we know is wrong, we begin to make justifications for us which demonstrates that we do know right from wrong. We do. You do know right from wrong. You have a conscience that tells you that there's a difference between right and wrong. And from early on in our life, even among children, we notice that there are times when we feel bad when we've done something wrong and we feel good when we've done something right. And that division between that right and wrong, it doesn't get solved by just going through life. We come to a place in our life where we realize, I need forgiveness. I am broken. I'm not what I should be. I want to be different than I am. And so we've been born into the family of Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. You were born into Adam's family. You were born with this sinful nature. You were born in sin, but you know what? The good news is you can be born again. Amen. That, that's the message of the gospel, that you can be born into a new family. You can be born into the family of Christ. You can be born, instead of being under the headship of Adam, you fall under the headship of Christ. You, you, you enter a new family. You go into the family of God. You become a part of, of God, and, and that's where all these blessings lie. All the blessings lie in belonging to Christ, in belonging to the family of God. So this great, great sense of, of all the blessings, they flow 
from being in this family of God. They're based on being in Christ. Every promise from God's master plan, every promise is fulfilled in Jesus. Look at verse 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on earth. God planned to sum everything up in Christ. You know, Jesus is not a supplemental plan. Jesus is not a backup plan. Jesus is the main plan. Jesus was in the plan from the beginning, from before the beginning. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Jesus is not just some new character that came on the, screen, on the scene after we already had all these years of Judaism. He was already planned from the very beginning. Jesus is the fulfillment, the culmination of everything that God was doing. God revealed himself first to the Jewish nation. He revealed himself to Abraham. And he gave Abraham these promises. But if you notice what Paul says in Galatians 3.16, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds. This is what Paul says. As referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Jesus was the seed of Abraham. Think about this. Abraham had a son named Isaac. He was born by a supernatural agency. They were beyond, Abraham and Sarah were beyond the years for producing a child. And God did a miracle. Isaac was the miracle baby. And Jesus also was born by supernatural inhibition. He was born of a virgin. So when the Bible talks about the seed of Abraham, it isn't just the people that come through the line of Abraham. He's ultimately saying it's the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus. And this seed is the same seed that goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15, right after the fall, whenever God promises that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. So there has been this line down through history of the seed of woman and the seed of the serpent all the way down to today. Jesus is the culmination of this grand plan. And belonging to Jesus is the only way to experience all the blessings of God. This is not some new religion that, you know, they had all these religions around and Jesus comes along and he's the latest new religious figure. Jesus is the son of God. He is the virgin born son of God who was with the Father from the beginning, all the way back in the annals of time. He planned this. This is all part of his master plan. I'm more excited about this than y'all are. I'm not sure. I'm way, way more excited. See, this is a grand strategy that God had from the very beginning. You know, when God made the promises to Abraham and to the people of Israel, all of his promises say, if you do this, then this will happen. If you do this, then this will happen. You know what happened with Israel? Again and again and again, they failed. They failed. In fact, Jeremiah says, you broke the covenant, he's saying to the nation of Israel. Jesus comes as the one and only righteous Israelite. Jesus is the one and only. In other words, all those promises, if then, Jesus completely fulfills them. If you look at the book of Matthew, Matthew charts the life of Jesus and he shows how Jesus is actually fulfilling everything that Israel was supposed to do. Out of Egypt, I called my son. He's pointing to Egypt, where Israel came out of Egypt. He, he goes to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. He's picturing going through the Red Sea. He goes into the wilderness to wander for 40 years to be tempted by the devil. And he passes the test, unlike Israel. Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to show and demonstrate all the blessings that God had intended for the nation of Israel. But because they were unfaithful and unrighteous, they never experienced them. So Jesus shows them, this is what it looks like whenever you fulfill the plan of God. Jesus is the one and only Jew who ever lived this righteous life. He is the fulfillment of everything God had in mind. When you read the Old Testament, you should read the Old Testament and see Jesus on every single page. It's pointing to what Jesus, God has planned this. This did not happen randomly. And listen, you all are not a part of a supplemental plan. You're not a bad, isn't that good? I mean, think about the supplemental plans here. Medicare and Medicaid. 
I'm not quite there yet, but I was reading about that. Boy, this stuff is expensive and complicated. Jesus is not a supplemental plan. He's the main plan. Amen? Jesus, belonging to Jesus is where it's at. This is a, a grand strategy. Peter was addressing the scattered believers, both Jews and Gentiles, and he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You belong to the family of God. I, 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 was, I, I meant to tell Tom today, let's sing family of God for our fellowship time. Because you need to hear those words again. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I belong to the family of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I'm, you, you know, sometimes people are in this life and they never experience belonging. You know, maybe you were the last kid picked in sports at school. Maybe everybody else was in a club, but you weren't in a club. Maybe you didn't grow up in a family where you felt like you belonged to the family. Kind of an oddball in the family. I used to think whenever I was a kid that I was adopted because my parents were so nice to my brother and sister and mean to me. I didn't know it was because I was bad. <laughs> but some people don't feel like they belong anywhere. And one of the great truths of the master plan of God and the plan God has for your life is that you belong. You belong to this family. You can come to this family and experience the belonging that comes from knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You belong in Christ. This is where the blessings lie. This is where the fulfillment and joy comes. It comes from belonging to Jesus. Paul calls this a mystery of his will, something that was previously hidden. And the great mystery that unfolds, and we'll see it in Ephesians, and you see it throughout the New Testament, is that from the beginning, God had told Abraham that he would be a blessing to all the nations. But the Jews kind of restricted their thinking to just the nation. They said, we've got this for ourselves. And Jesus came to say, I came for all of you. You can be a part of this. This is for Jew and Gentile, slave and free. There's neither male nor female, nor Jew nor Gentile. All are one in Christ. All of you, every one of you, can be part of this belonging to the family of God. You belong. How do you receive the blessings that come from belonging to him? You come to the blessings of belonging to Jesus by believing. Amen. So that's the third major theme. Every blessing from flows from belonging to Jesus, and only those who believe belong to Jesus. First Ephesians uh, 1 Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Notice there's listening to the message of truth, the gospel, and then there's believing. You know, believing is not simply making a mental assent just making a statement. You know, sometimes I'll talk to somebody and they'll say, I believe in God, or I believe there is a God. But, but that's not what the Bible's talking about when it talks about believing in Him. Because James 2.19 says the demons believe and they tremble. So it's not just about saying that I agree that there is a God. Believing in Him means making a commitment to Him. It means, it means investing yourself into him. When, when Jesus was calling his disciples, he said to them, come, follow me. There's a sense in which following Jesus doesn't mean just going toward Jesus. It means turning away from something else. They turned away from their old life. Peter and Andrew were fixing nets with their father in the boat, and all of a sudden, was it not? Anyway, somebody dropped their nets. They dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. Matthew, I think Matthew was a tax collector and he dropped his pen and followed Jesus. Well, he picked his pen back up, but he dropped his tax books and he followed Jesus. So following Jesus is, is that's why we use the word repentance. It's a difficult word. It, metanoia means to change your mind. It means turning from an old life and turning to a new life. 
So when we talk about believing in Jesus, it's, it's more than just making a mental ascent, making a statement that I believe that there is a God. It's saying that I'm willing to invest myself in him. I'm committing my life to him. I know you've heard this illustration before, but take this chair, for example. This chair looks like a pretty sturdy chair, pretty strong, engineered well. This is a, this is a good chair, good solid chair. John, good chair, right? Good chair, well-built chair. I believe, well, actually, let me say it this way. I think this chair will hold me up. Do you think this chair will hold me up? You all do. Well, how do you know? No, 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 no. That's not faith. This is faith. This is faith. You see the difference? I can say all I want to that, this, that I think this chair will hold me up. But the moment I'm willing to take the risk of committing myself to sitting in this chair, now I've moved from just a mental ascent to saying, I believe. And that's what we ask folks to do whenever they trust Jesus as their Savior. It's, a, it's an abandonment of trying to do everything on your own. It's an abandonment to doing things the way you've always done them. It's a decision that I'm committing my life to Jesus. You know, once you've done that, once you've made that decision, now I believe what's happening is there's a supernatural work going on. The Holy Spirit is working on your heart. The Holy Spirit is calling you to himself. And once you make that decision, you step over the line and you say, I've put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm committing my life to him. Listen. That is the very beginning of all the blessings of belonging to him. And, and it doesn't stop there. How do you live the Christian life? You live the Christian life by faith in him. You, you don't miraculously suddenly wake up one day and stop doing bad things and start doing good things. Some things probably fall away immediately. But this is a work of God that he's doing on and on and on throughout your life. If you've been saved for years, you're experiencing the blessing. If you have been believing all these years, you're experiencing blessings unlike anything you had when you first became a Christian. Some of you became Christians when you were little kids. You could hardly, hardly get anything wrong. You hardly had any, I mean, you hardly had any sins to repent of. I mean, I got saved when I was seven out of a life of sin and degradation. Can you imagine how much sin and wickedness I had as a seven-year-old? It was minor compared to some of y'all, really. <laughs> but when I, but, but that doesn't mean that it ends there. Because we're in a war. And the enemy, the, the, we, have, we have the foes, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They will try to take us off our game. They will try to push us aside. They'll try to get us to abandon Jesus. But I'm telling you that all the blessings of God flow from believing in him and having our life in him so that we belong to him. This, this idea of blessing and belonging and believing is a part of the Christian life. And, and I want you to notice something. I didn't say behaving. See, that's what the world wants you to say. They want, they want to turn it into legalism. And maybe that's the way you've grown up. And I'm not saying that I'm against the law. I'm saying the law won't get you there, but faith will. I'm saying that you will get to the place where God begins to help you to behave by the power of the Spirit, but it won't be because you've got a set of rules that keep you in line. It'll be because you have a loving relationship with Jesus and you want to live for Him. You want your life to be a reflection of Him. Three times in this passage, I wasn't going to go here. I don't know what time it is yet. Are we close? I can't, the, clock, the clock stopped over there, so y'all are on your own. <laughs> Three times in this passage, Paul says... To the praise of the glory of his grace. Live to the to be to the praise of the glory of his grace. He's describing what it would be like if you lived your life in such a way that it would bring praise to God. Bring praise to the glory, the majesty, the wonder of his grace. Think about this. I don't know if anybody, anybody ever seen the Mona Lisa? Been, been to the... The, the Louvre and seeing the Mona Lisa? Joanne has. All right, a couple of you have. 
Have you ever seen uh, 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 the Sistine Chapel? Anybody seen the Sistine Chapel? All right, a few of you have. You've probably seen them in movies or whatever. But you know, when you go, when we went to see the Mona Lisa, I thought it was going to be this wonderful, great, giant painting. You, it's tiny. I, I mean, I, I can't remember. It's like maybe 18 by 25 or something like that. It's a tiny little picture. You can hardly get to it, though, because of the crowds of people that are all around it. You have to wait your turn. People are standing. And everybody goes to that painting. Well, my reaction was, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a woman. <laughs> she barely has a smile on her face. But everybody says, who knows what they're looking at, this is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece created by an artist. But you know what? Whenever people see the Mona Lisa, you know what they do? They don't just look at the masterpiece. by Leonardo da Vinci to the praise of his glory. Do you see what I mean? See, God wants us to live in such a way that people will look at us and we will live to the praise of the glory of God. That people will look at us and they'll say, look at what God has done. Look at this masterpiece. Each and every one of you, you are a masterpiece created by God. Now, I know when Leonardo da Vinci started that painting, he probably started with some pencil sketches and slowly but surely began to fill in all the details. Maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe all the, the, the beauty of the masterpiece isn't fully filled out yet. We're all a work under construction. But the only way you experience the full breadth of the blessings of God is to live out a life of faith, believing in him, belonging to him. That's what this is about. And your behavior should be a reflection of how good you have it because you've been blessed by God and you belong to him. And you're empowered by the Spirit of God to live out a life that is meaningful and fulfilling and joyful. I want that for you. Amen? I want you to come to the place where you say, I... God has a master plan for my life, and I want to follow God's plan. I want to experience the goodness of God. Now, this is an introduction to the series, but now I have an invitation. If you've never experienced this, if you've never experienced believing in Jesus, putting your faith and trust in Him, that's the beginning place for you. God started all this in the past, but you finally grasp it when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and you are in Christ. And you experience from being in Christ all the blessing of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we pray right now that you would do a work in hearts and lives. That today would be a day, first Sunday of the new year, to take a new step forward in our walk with you. To embrace all the goodness and grace that you've granted us through Jesus Christ. So that we live this out before a watching world. Father, I pray for those who are here today that need to make a decision, that even, even just need to reach out and say, all right, Lord, I'm ready to say I believe. I'm ready to give my heart to you. I pray that today someone would make that decision. They would make that turning point today. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. If you have a decision, I'll be down here at the front to receive you.